On December 2nd, 1942, beneath the west stands of Stagg Field in Chicago, a small group of scientists and technicians initiated what was perhaps the greatest experiment of the 20th century, the first controlled release of nuclear energy. Plutonium project leader Arthur Holly Compton remembers. We entered the balcony at one end of the room. On the balcony, a dozen scientists were watching the instrument and handling the control. Across the room was a large cubicle pile of graphite and uranium blocks in which we hoped the atomic chain reaction would develop. Inserted into openings in this pile of blocks were control and safety rods. After a few preliminary tests, Fermi gave the order to withdraw the control rod another foot. He knew that that was going to be the real test. The Geiger counters registering the neutrons from the reactor began to click faster and faster until their sound became a rattle. Throw in the safety rods came Fermi's order. The rattle of the counters fell to a slow series of clicks. For the first time, atomic power had been released. It had been controlled and stopped. The 25th anniversary of the historic Stagg Field experiment was recently celebrated on the 77-year-old campus of the University of Chicago. This is the academic arena where 25 Nobel Prize winners have taught and studied. And it is also here that Italian physicist Enrico Fermi, at the age of 41, directed the famous experiment in a racket's court. The anniversary ceremonies commemorating the event and featuring many of the distinguished scientists, government leaders, and prominent pioneers of the nuclear age began on the morning of December 1st, 1967, in Breasted Hall. Dr. George Beadle, president of the University of Chicago, welcomed the many guests attending the reunion, which was partly financed by a $25,000 grant from the Commonwealth Edison Company of Chicago. Thirty-three of the approximately 42 persons who were with Fermi at Stagg Field on December 2, 1942, attended the international event. The ceremonies began with a retrospective session chaired by Henry Smythe, Emeritus Professor of Physics from Princeton University and the United States representative to the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna, Austria. It was a time to remember, a time to reflect upon just what did happen a quarter of a century ago in Chicago. Dr. Herbert L. Anderson, professor of physics and director of the Enrico Fermi Institute for Nuclear Studies and also chairman of the Anniversary Planning Committee, spoke of the involved process for purifying natural uranium used in the first pile. Canadian-born Walter Zinn, former director of the Argonne National Laboratory and now vice president of combustion engineering of Windsor, Connecticut, also addressed the session. He told of the many difficulties encountered in obtaining and machining the graphite used in the pile. The final speaker on the morning session was Crawford Greenewald of the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. His remarks crystallized private industry's patriotic contribution to what was then an unprecedented adventure. An afternoon session on the history and applications of atomic energy followed, featuring speeches by six Nobel laureate scientists. A dinner speech recalling the early days of Enrico Fermi was given later that evening by Nobel laureate Emilio Sagre of the University of California. On Saturday morning, following a prospective session on international uses of atomic energy, a special December 2nd observance of the world's first nuclear chain reaction was held in Mandel Hall. Dr. George Beadle, the man responsible for establishing the anniversary committee, began the festivities. Welcome to the University of Chicago. 
For many of you, this is, in every sense, a homecoming. Those who were present on that chilly December afternoon 25 years ago, when man first knew it was possible to harness the power of the atom, may find the scene vastly different. The Old West stands and Stag Field itself soon will be the site of our Joseph Regenstein Library, one of the finest in the world. This has been a significant program, and we look forward to hearing from those who have been largely responsible for charting the progress of nuclear energy. Dr. Seaborg rightly is the chief spokesman for this part of the program. Nuclear energy has already been responsible for great benefits to mankind. We are confident that the next 25 years will see even greater progress in the peaceful uses of the atom. Thank you. Thank you, George. I would now like to attempt to introduce the members of the original Fermi team, the people who participated in the historic uh, uh, CP1 experiment here in Chicago, a few blocks from here in the squash board under the west end of the football field. Uh, the experiment that took uh, place exactly 25 years ago today at about 3.25, 3.30 uh, in the afternoon. I have uh, these people here. And I'd like to begin with Harold M. Ag a total of 33 members of the original Fermi team were present in the audience to acknowledge the introductions by Dr. Seaborg. The Lichtenberger of Combustion Engineering. <laughs> Norman Hilbury of the uh, University of Arizona the associate director of the project during the war. Norman, you can't get away with that. Come on down here. Norman always was a strong-willed person. The introductions by Dr. Seaborg continued as the atomic fraternity of scientists and technicians stood to acknowledge 25 years later the appreciation of their efforts to unleash the power of the atom. Leo Saran of the Argonne National Laboratory. Frank H. Spedding of the Iowa State University of Science and Technology. William J. Sturm of the Argonne National Laboratory. Albert Wattenberg of the University of Illinois. M. H. Wilkening of the New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology. <laughs> Valney C. Wilson of the General Electric Company. Dr. Seaborg also introduced many of the distinguished people in the audience while waiting to begin the international satellite hookup, bringing together the televised exchange of anniversary greetings by President Johnson in Washington with the ceremonies in Chicago and the greeting of President Giuseppe Saragat in Rome, Italy. When the time approached to begin the three-way satellite television program, Dr. Seaborg began his introductory remarks. Good evening to our friends in Rome. It's a great pleasure for those of us here at Chicago to join with you to observe this 25th anniversary of the first nuclear chain reaction. We're especially honored to have President Saragat on hand in Rome and Minister Andriotti and Professor Salvetti. More than any other person, this ceremony honors the great Italian physicist Enrico Fermi, for it was the dedicated group under his direction here at the University of Chicago in 1942 that accomplished the event we are commemorating today, the first controlled release of nuclear energy. Enrico Fermi's historic experiment, perhaps the greatest scientific experiment in the 20th century was the discovery that opened up a whole new world and began the nuclear age. Today we are fortunate that by way of the communication satellite it is possible to link the place of discovery 
here at the University of Chicago with the homeland of the discoverer, Italy. Now, we're fortunate to have with us for this anniversary observance Mrs. Enrico Fermi and many of the members of that team of scientists and engineers who worked with her husband in first harnessing the nucleus of the atom. I would like to introduce Mrs. Enrico Fermi and her two grandchildren. Now I'd like to introduce the Fermi team, including Dr. Walter Zinn and Professor Herbert Anderson. While he's in, perhaps you could stand up for special acknowledgement. And Herb Anderson, who is the, uh, in charge of this commemorative program. Now I'd like to introduce Mrs. Arthur Holly Compton, the wife of the director of the Plutonium Project. <laughs> I'd like to introduce Professor Emilio Segre, who was Enrico Fermi's colleague, beginning with the early days in Rome. Where they <laughs> now I'd like to introduce General Leslie R. Grove, who was in charge of the whole atomic energy program in the United States <laughs> during the war. His Excellency, Ambassador Ortona, Ambassador from Italy to the United States. <laughs> Mayor Richard Daly of Chicago. Uh, Commissioner Gerald F. Tate of the Atomic Energy Commission. And Robert B. Duffield, the director of the Argonne National Laboratory. <laughs> and Robert R. Wilson, the director of the National Accelerator Laboratory, which, as you know, <laughs> is situated here near Chicago at Weston. And Kenneth A. Dunbar, manager of the Chicago Operations Office of the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission. <laughs> our host of 25 years ago and our host today, the University of Chicago, represented by its president, Dr. George W. Beadle. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to introduce to you the president of the United States. President Sargot, Mrs. Fermi, Mayor Daly, members of the Fermi team, Dr. Seaborg, and distinguished guests. I believe that history will record that on this day 25 years ago, mankind reached the turning point of his destiny. The book of Genesis tells us that in the beginning, God directed man to be fruitful and multiply and to replenish the earth and subdue it. But only in our lifetime have we acquired the ultimate power to fulfill all of that command. President Johnson spoke of the historical bond between the old world and the new, and how many European immigrants like Enrico Fermi had escaped the forces of tyranny and found new hope in America for the pursuit of their dream. He also referred to the great strides now being made in the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. When I became president, nuclear energy was generating about uh, one million kilowatts of electric power in the United States. Today, the atom is giving us more than 2,800,000 kilowatts, almost three times as much, and more than 70 additional nuclear power plants are already planned, are, are now under construction. So this will equal about 20% of the whole electric generation capacity in the United States today. It is enough to meet the total requirements of 45 million people. And all of this from what was 25 years ago, before the success of Fermi's experiment, only just a scientist's dream. The dream has been realized. 
The president went on to spell out the dilemma that faces all mankind, trying to remove the threat while preserving the promise of atomic power. He spoke of the non-proliferation treaty for nuclear weapons. So, I am today announcing that when such safeguards are applied under the treaty, the United States will permit the International Atomic Energy Agency to apply its safeguards to all nuclear activities in the United States, excluding only those with direct national security significance. And under this offer, the agency will then be able to inspect a broad range of United States nuclear activities, both governmental and private, including the fuel in nuclear-powered reactors owned by utilities for generating less electricity, and the fabrication, the chemical, and the reprocessing of such fuel. This pledge maintains the consistent policy of the United States since the very beginning of the nuclear age. The chief executive renewed the pledge made by former President Eisenhower 14 years ago in an address to the United Nations that America reaffirms its dedication to the life of man rather than to his death. And let us use, then, this historic anniversary to deepen and to reaffirm the search for peace. Let us so conduct ourselves that future generations will look back upon December 2nd, 1942, not as the origin of sorrow and despair, but as, but as the beginning, the beginning of the brightest and the most inspiring chapter in the long history of man. And now from Rome, the president of Italy, Giuseppe Saraga. Mr. President, in addressing to you and to the whole people of the United States of America a greeting from Italy, I wish to tell you how much we are glad to celebrate in an ideal spirit of togetherness with the great friendly and allied nation from beyond the Atlantic, the 25th anniversary of the first nuclear chain reaction achieved by the greatest Italian physicist of his time, Enrico Fermi, with the collaboration of an outstanding group of scientists both from the United States and from other countries. President Saragat spoke of the collective aspects of all disciplines of science and technology which helped achieve the first successful chain reaction. He cited the early influences of the famous School of Rome under Professor Corbino, where the young Fermi, along with Sagre and Rossetti, wrestled with the theoretical aspects of nuclear physics. The president also spoke of the long and fruitful exchanges between Italy and America. The United States was opening its doors to all those that were persecuted and offering generously to them living conditions and working conditions that allowed them to give the very best of themselves in all the possible fields. This was the shining prelude to that overall commitment of the American nation, which in, face, in the face of a European crisis brought about by this terrible war brought by regimes which were born enemies of freedom and justice was offering the blood of his son to save everyone. The Italian president touched upon the important choice facing all mankind of becoming educated to the new and demanding conditions of the nuclear age. He closed his remarks with the hope and promise held in the peaceful uses of atomic energy.
If the men of goodwill will be able to channel the resources which were unlocked with the pile of 1942 towards the economic and social betterment of all the people, this nuclear anniversary which we are which we're celebrating today is going to be the first in a series of steps towards uh, liberating mankind from one from fear in a climate of peace, of freedom and justice. It is in this spirit and in this condition, Mr. President, that the Italian people joins me in celebrating with you and with the friendly people of the United States, the greatest conquest of our era. Thank you, President Surrogate, President Johnson, and members of the Fermi team. This brings to an end this uh, historic observance of the 25th anniversary of the first nuclear chain reaction. Later that afternoon, a scheduled unveiling of the Henry Moore anniversary sculpture was held on the east side of Ellis Avenue at the exact site where the first atomic pile went critical. The unveiling was to occur at exactly 3.36 p.m., 25 years to the minute after the first reaction was sustained. A 6,000-pound, 12-foot rendering entitled Nuclear Energy was specially commissioned by the trustees of the Chicago Art Institute. Dr. Beadle again made the opening remarks. Mrs. Fermi, Ambassador Ortona, honored guests, we welcome you to this significant occasion. We are thankful today for many things. We are grateful that Henry Moore created a fitting memorial to the work of the gifted scientists, engineers, and technicians who developed the first nuclear reactor. We are also pleased that the trustees of the Art Institute of Chicago and the B.F. Ferguson Monument Fund have chosen this historic site for this remarkable sculpture. In the years to come, thousands will visit this site as they have in the past. I join you in the hope that they will see in Mr. Moore's work the peaceful promises of the experiment that took place here on December 2nd, 1942. Thank you. Dr. William McNeil, chairman of the University of Chicago History Department, reflected on the implications of the first controlled release of atomic energy for mankind. He also described what the scene was like on that cold, snowy afternoon at Stag Field. He then introduced the dignitaries who had come to share in the unveiling ceremonies. Mr. Sigvard Eklund, Secretary General of the International Atomic Energy Agency in Austria. Dr. Glenn Seaborg of the Atomic Energy Commission. Mr. Gerald Tape of the Atomic Energy Commission. General Leslie R. Groves, retired. British sculptor Henry Moore, and next to him, Laura Fermi, wife of the late physicist. Following a short speech on the testimony of sculpture by University of Chicago art professor Harold Hayden, it was time to perform the unveiling. Mrs. Fermi, with the help of Henry Moore and President Beadle, approached the base of the statue as Dr. Herbert Anderson counted off the seconds. The shroud finally fell away and uncovered the large bronze sculpture, which instantly became physical testimony to the pioneering work of Enrico Fermi. The committee to consider plans for this 25th anniversary was established four years ago by University President George Beadle. Three members of the committee flew to London to discuss the development of a possible monument with the British sculptor.
Moore later came to Chicago himself to visit the site and begin plans for developing his concept of the monument. After four years of planning and work in his studio outside London, Moore had the sculpture cast in West Berlin, Germany, and it arrived in Chicago by ship on October 27, 37 days before the anniversary date. A collection of 70 bronze, plaster, terracotta, and alabaster sculptures by Moore, along with 35 of his drawings, were on special exhibition in the High Energy Physics Building on the university campus. The exhibit, sponsored by the university's Renaissance Society and the Committee for the 25th Anniversary Observance, was organized by Joseph Shapiro, society director. The two-day ceremonies ended Saturday night, December 2nd, with a civic dinner for 500 guests, who sat in on a premiere showing of the 30-minute color motion picture, The Day Tomorrow Began. Here, amid the coursing wartime activity of a Midwestern university, a small band of men secretly embarked upon an odyssey they could barely comprehend. Many who labored here in this demolished arena are gone. Zillard, Compton, Graves, Sloten, Allison, and Fermi himself. All that remains is this muted monument conceived by a 69-year-old British artisan who forged in bronze what 42 men forged in a primitive graphite pile 25 years ago at the University of Chicago. This 25th anniversary ceremony was awarded the Silver Anvil Award for the highest achievement in the field of public relations. It was shared by the University of Chicago and the Atomic Energy Commission.